We must now move on to questions to the Minister for Finance and Personnel. And we will start with listed questions. I must tell members that question six has been withdrawn. And I call Mr. Michael Mejumpsey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number one. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The last revaluation of business properties in Northern Ireland was back in 2003 and was based on 2001 rental values. The current revaluation process for the 73,000 non domestic properties is being based on 2013 values and will come into effect in April of 2015. This exercise is about restoring fairness and how the business rates burden is shared, essentially rebalancing the same amount of business rates but using current values to share out the liability. Land and Property Services was engaged in the second half of 2013 in collecting and analysing rental information, building cost data and other business information. Detailed work on the valuation phase of the revaluation by LPS professional valuation staff is now well advanced and on target to produce draft valuations for all offices, shops, warehouses and factories by the end of March. Other property types will follow over the next four months. All draft values, when completed, will be extensively reviewed and quality assured over the period until late September, when they will be released in bulk form to councils and my department to assist with district rate and regional rate projections for 2015-16. Call Mr Gregory Campbell. Michael and Jim Seed for your supplementary. Uh, that's uh, quite all right, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I've been called many things in my life, but never <laughs> Mr. Gregory <laughs> Campbell. Never as insulted as that. Never as insulted. Can I thank the Minister for his, uh, his comprehensive answer? Could I ask him that, bearing in mind we have currently 50% rebates for empty buildings for landlords and owners, and we also have similar rebates for uh, rented properties above and below a certain retail uh, rebate uh, valuation. Uh, could he tell us where he expects that to be sitting, uh, those rebates, once his revaluation is completed? Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Perhaps the, perhaps the Deputy Speaker thought the answer was so comprehensive that it asked, answered the member supplementary. Um, the revaluation won't have any effect per se on those uh, reliefs that are, and allowances that are, are currently in place. Uh, and I have no intentions in touching, for, for example, the relief that is there on vacant properties, which is at 50 per cent, which I, I would like to point out, Deputy Speaker, is far more generous than what is in place across the water. And I do hear from time to time uh, some business organisations, even some members of this House, saying that we should uh, you know, increase that to 100 per cent relief. Well, if you compare that to what happens across the water, uh, I think in, in, in Scotland is it currently at 90% uh, liability, so only 10% relief, and I think they are doing away with it completely in England and Wales. So the revaluation is, as I said, an attempt to rebalance the rating system uh, in a fairer way, but still raising the same amount of money. So those sorts of reliefs and allowances that the member talks about aren't actually going to be touched or affected by this revaluation. Can I call Mr Gregory Campbell? Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, can the Minister give us his, his assessment of what the revaluation will do in terms of empty shops uh, in town centres, particularly in competing with age of centre and out of uh, centre uh, developments? Uh, given the stats that we see and just on stats, would he join with me in congratulating uh, Kelly Gallagher, who I understand is an ISRA employee and he is the Minister responsible? Uh, yeah, could deal with that latter point first. Uh, I, I would like to join with others, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, in congratulating Kelly on her fantastic success in Sochi this morning. Uh, Mr Campbell is right. She is an employee of NISRA, which is within the Department of Finance and Personnel. And I understand she is currently on a career break, but, uh, and I can say now I can advertise career breaks. If members of the civil service wish to take career breaks, which result in winning uh, Paralympic and Olympic gold medals, they they're, will be very much encouraged in that endeavour, Mr Deputy Speaker. But on, on Mr, Mr Campbell's question, um, the, the issue of empty properties is one that I'm, I'm well aware of. There, there wouldn't be a, a town in Northern Ireland that, that I would visit um, in my capacity as finance minister. In fact, I visited Coleraine very early on in my tenure, and it was one of the issues that was raised by traders in, in Coleraine that was blighting, blighting their town centre. The revaluation can't, Deputy Speaker, and it won't deal with empty shops directly. Um, I think part of the problem with empty shops comes in Northern Ireland. There's a whole myriad of reasons. The advances in, in technology and people using online shopping, uh, obviously the growth in uh, large retailers and large supermarkets has had a, a negative impact on many of our town centres. Uh, and in some ways there, is, there has been traditionally, I think, an oversupply of shops in Northern Ireland. And there is little that any changes to the rating system can actually do to that. 
what, what I can ensure will be the case is that until the end of 2015, Empty property relief, which was introduced by my predecessor, which gives that exactly that, that 50 per cent um, relief that is there for empty vacant properties, continues into the first year of operation. And to date, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm pleased to report that some 229 businesses in Northern Ireland have opened since 2012, April of 2012, as a result of that policy, employing hundreds of, of people across Northern Ireland, and that has seen some £791,000 in rates relief go to those what were previously vacant shops but are now uh, thriving businesses. Mr. Dominic Bradley. August, while in the minister, um, he's probably aware that many businesses uh, are holding out the hope uh, that this revaluation process uh, will bring them a reduction in their rates bills. Uh, can I ask the minister uh, what the likelihood is that their hopes will be fulfilled? Um, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I'm, I'm not in the business of dashing anyone's hopes, but uh, one would have to be realistic in this case. As the member will know, and certainly I think through his work on the uh, Finance and Personnel Committee, that there will be some winners in respect of revaluation. Some people will see their rates bill go down, some people will see their rates bill go up. Uh, the vast majority of people will probably see their rates bill re remain more or less the same. The vast majority of people, the last time the revaluation was done over a decade ago, Deputy Speaker saw theirs change by uh, up plus or minus about 20 per cent. Um, so, you know, I can't, unfortunately, and I appreciate that there is some hope, and I think this is something that we all have, a, having all asked for this revaluation to happen and wanting to see this revaluation go ahead when it did and, and not delay it further. It had been already delayed. I noticed that in England they have delayed theirs a further two years, and the government there are under heavy criticism because they're delaying it further. I think it's right that we proceed, albeit it is in, in, within a challenging environment that we proceed. Um, but I think it's incumbent upon us all that we don't raise hopes um, too high um, without justification and suggest to everybody that because of the revaluation their, their bills will automatically go down. Some will see their, their bills go down. It depends on changes in, in trends and shopping in particular uh, localities and perhaps the impact of large retailers and where large retailers have had maybe a, a bigger impact on some towns. Perhaps you might expect to see rents within, or rates within town centres go down, but that's no, by no means guaranteed. So I think it's important that we get a message across to people that this is to try to get some restore some fairness and some balance to the rating system, but it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody will be the beneficiary. Ms. Michaela Boyle. Gormaga, Cam Colia. Uh, obviously, re-evaluation has been long overdue. Uh, however, there are genuine concerns about the impact it may have on uh, business overheads. Will or has the department uh, carried out an assessment of the extent of the possible impact that this will have on jobs and businesses? Gormaga. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the work is, is, as I mentioned in reply to Mr. Majimsi, first question is still ongoing, and we don't have all of the data in place yet to say what the new NAVs for, for properties will be after the evaluation, so it's hard to then work that into. And obviously, we don't even know what the, uh, the rate poundage is for that first year in 2015, whenever uh, the, these uh, new valuations will be valid. So it's kind of hard to actually work that out. But you know, I would re-emphasize the point that I have made already, that the overall rate take will remain the same. Now, whilst there will be some people who will see their rates perhaps go up a little and some people will see them go down a little, overall cost uh, to business through non-domestic rating in Northern Ireland will not fundamentally change, uh, in fact, won't change at all uh, as a result of this valuation. Um, but I do expect that there will be some, as I said, there will be some people who will win, there will be some people who will lose, um, but the, the bulk of people will remain more or less the same. Well, Mr. Dathy Mackay for a question. Case de Verdeau, question number two. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, with your permission, uh, I would like to take questions two and seven together. Uh, I have met with the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform, Brendan Howland, today, and I am glad the member changed his original question. He had a very short answer um, to discuss the approach to reform being taken forward in the Republic of Ireland to understand how best practice has been applied and how this could be adapted and implemented within Northern Ireland. I have also met with John Swinney and his officials responsible for public sector reform in Scotland, and I have also accepted an offer to meet with Francis Maud, the Cabinet Office Minister. My officials are meeting with respective counterparts in Dublin this week to further the discussions on potential areas for collaboration and learning in the area of reform going forward. 
The public sector reform division is engaged in building informed and skilled uh, capacity to facilitate the progress of public sector reform and improvement in Northern Ireland and encourage innovation in future service delivery and policy development. The team, which comprises staff from several departments, has been engaging with a wide number of stakeholders to develop a program of work uh, and a future action plan which will incorporate input from other government departments, the community and voluntary sector, private sector and other arm's length bodies to inform methodologies and develop strategic plans. PSRD staff have also been testing out some of the proposed innovative approaches through collaboration with cross-departmental representatives to garner views and suggestions on how best to support and encourage staff in creating a culture of continuous improvement. Mr. Matai for a supplementary. Can I, get a, a last can, can I thank the Minister for his, for his answer and can I welcome the fact that he's looking to a number of different places uh, close to home and further afield in Europe in terms of public service reform uh, proposals. Uh, can I say to the Minister, I mean, public service reform in terms of the Dub Dublin government is very much synonymous uh, with proposals to cut public sector jobs, uh, which is something we should all be concerned about. Uh, and can I say in regard to, to here, uh, can I ask the Minister what guarantee can you give that to public se sector workers in particular uh, that public service reform in the North does not equal job cuts? I thank the member uh, for a supplementary. Uh, and I'm very, very keen to learn from any jurisdiction. Uh, I don't think we have any monopoly on wisdom in Northern Ireland, no matter what some of us might think. Um, but I'm very prepared to, to learn from anywhere and everywhere. And I hope my answer outlined that I'm, I'm not adverse to learning from counterparts in the Irish Republic, uh, from counterparts in Scotland and elsewhere within the United Kingdom, indeed across Europe and, and further afield. Uh, and the reason I'm not uh, prepared to sort of think of ourselves in isolation is because the problems that all of those states that I mentioned, and it could have a fairly extensive list, are all grappling, Mr Deputy Speaker, with the same problems that we are, which is uh, decreasing public expenditure, lower growth in the economy, and rising public expectations. So we all grapple with the same problems, and some of the answers, while it's not directly applicable from one jurisdiction to another, will have some learning, uh, positive learning contained within them. Um, and in some ways, actually, other jurisdictions have things to learn from Northern Ireland. Uh, the Republic of Ireland would be one of those places that I would point out is perhaps in some respects, uh, in some areas of reform, a little further behind than Northern Ireland is. Uh, I know that uh, one of Mr Howland's ministerial counterparts, Brian Hayes, the Minister for, responsible for the Office of Public Works, visited Northern Ireland to look at our shared service provision uh, about a year or so ago. So there are areas I think that they can learn from us, just as there are areas that we can learn from them. And, and, and in relation to the particular point that the member raises about job losses, I mean I think the, where the Irish government are in terms of the quantity of the problems that they face in respect of public spending um, puts them in a slightly different position than we are, different, slightly different starting point. Our pressures are, are similar in terms of less public spending, but obviously they have had to go incredibly quick and incredibly fast at cutting their, the cost of government. I don't think that we are coming at from exactly the same position. And therefore, you know, I can give some assurance that this isn't a, a reform isn't sort of code for gutting public services and sacking people. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's about getting the most from what we have and the, the expenditure that we're putting into public services in Northern Ireland so that our citizens, the people who elect us to serve them here in Stormont, are getting the best possible outcomes. Call Mr. Alistair Ross. Deputy Speaker, I hope all of us would support increased effectiveness and efficiency within the public sector. On that note, can the Minister indicate to the House what direct engagement he has had with his ministerial colleagues here in Northern Ireland and whether they are positively embracing his vision for reform within the public sector? Uh, yes, I, I have. I've begun an engagement, a series of engagements with uh, ministerial colleagues on a one-to-one -one basis, and that's, in, I suppose, in the initial stages to outline why I think reform is required to uh, promote what the public sector reform division within DFP are doing and the, the sort of areas of work that they are developing and trying to get people to see it as, a, a cent see it as exactly what it is, which is a, a central resource located within DFP, which is there for other departments to use as and when they think necessary. Because, of course, reform might be something that I want to positively push and promote. Uh, ultimately, reforms will remain the uh, responsibility of individual ministers. So I have commenced that uh, direct one-to-one -one engagement with ministerial colleagues. I met with the Minister of Justice, Minister of Employment and Learning, Ministers of Social Development, uh, Enterprise and Health as well. And I'm due to meet with the uh, First and Deputy First Minister next week upon their return from the United States and have other meetings with other ministerial colleagues lined up. And I have to say the reaction so far, Deputy Speaker, has been positive. I think all ministers 
identify that there is a challenge moving forward in terms of public spending, but yet all the time we're going to have to continue to improve uh, the services that we deliver on behalf of, of our people. Um, and I have had positive responses to the areas of work that we have already assigned to the Public Sector Reform Division, uh, and I can see many ministers seeing the opportunities that the Public Sector Reform Division presents them, and I look forward to developing that initial interest and coming forward with concrete initiatives. Mr. William Humphrey for question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number three. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I recently attended the official announcement of the University of Ulster's Greater Belfast Development Scheme, along with senior officials from the European Investment Bank. This project, which will provide a significant boost to Belfast City Centre and indeed in the member zone North Belfast constituency, has benefited from £150 million of European Investment Bank financing. Of course, the executive also recently provided some. £35 million of financial transactions capital funding to the project. As the University of Ulster project demonstrates, there may be significant opportunities for Northern Ireland to benefit from the competitive lending rates that the EIB can offer. This includes within the new local government structure, the regulated asset base such as our electricity, gas and telecoms infrastructure, or indeed other private sector projects. I am very keen to see the European Investment Bank fund more projects in Northern Ireland and I intend to engage further with senior officials from the bank in the very near future. Mr. Humphrey, for uh, supplementary. Thank, thank Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for his reply and indeed welcome the £150 million investment in the University of Ulster campus in North Belfast. But can I ask the Minister how will he explore further opportunities for European investment bank funding in Northern Ireland? Yeah, I, I, I think the £150 million loan from the European investment bank to the um, to the University of Ulster is a, is a real vote of confidence uh, in the University, in Belfast and in Northern Ireland as a whole. And I, I look forward over the next number of years as that project sort of progressively rolls out to seeing that corner of, of our capital city redeveloped and regenerated for the, for the benefit of not just Belfast but for the whole of the province. Uh, I think there are opportunities beyond um, the University of Ulster project, um, which was the first direct investment by the EIB in Northern Ireland for over a decade, certainly since the return of uh, devolution in 2007. I think there are opportunities elsewhere within the university sector. Um, I think also within our uh, reformed and reorganised local government there are opportunities for those new councils with the new powers that they will get to perhaps avail of EIB funding. Um, I will be meeting with uh, officials from the European Investment Bank in, in Luxembourg later this month to hollow out how we might be able to uh, produce and patch together some of those deals, those large-scale deals which they are interested in, which will be the benefit of Northern Ireland's infrastructure development. And I also intend to follow it up with a seminar later in this month with um, guests including local government uh, chief executives and others within the university sector and elsewhere um, to look not just at the potential for EIB funding, because uh, you know, I don't think we should look at EIB funding as just the sole answer to developing infrastructure in Northern Ireland, but there are also other opportunities, including financial transactions, capital, or other financial instru instruments like tax increment financing. And I'm keen to scope out with local government and, and indeed other partners um, the extent of their ambitions in respect of investing in infrastructure in their areas and seeing whether EIB or some of those other options are available. Mr. Sander Overend. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his responses so far. Could the Minister advise if the EIB's investment schemes are, signific are significantly different from loans available under the Reinvestment and Reform Initiative? Yeah, there is, a, there is a, a very significant, almost very technical difference, but there is a significant difference nonetheless in terms of how um, IMI Department would, would deal with a loan coming from the EIB versus one from RRI. RRI, um, we are allowed to borrow up to two, £200 million pounds a year, up to an, a total of £3 billion in Northern Ireland, which we are very close to, actually, uh, at the minute. Um, it is repayable, but it doesn't significantly it doesn't score um, against our, um, our, on our balance sheet as, as a loan coming in. It actually doesn't, it doesn't come away from our uh, capital Dell, which we receive from Treasury on an annual basis, which is a significant difference with EIB funding. If we were, as an executive, to borrow money from the EIB for, say, a hospital project or an education project or even a transport project, the problem with that is that that would come directly off a Treasury would take however much we borrowed from the EIB directly off our capital Dell limits, and we would still have interest to repay on the loan. 
So in, in, instead of being in a better position taking an EIB loan, we'd actually be in a far worse position because we would be down money ultimately. So clearly we don't want to get into that position, but that doesn't mean that the option of EIB funding is completely closed down, Deputy Speaker, and that's why I'm keen to explore opportunities with the likes of local government, with uh, those who are in ownership of our regulated asset base, like the energy sector, uh, and indeed uh, elsewhere within the university sector, to see whether they, because they don't fall foul of those same Treasury rules, would be keen to look at the EIB or indeed some of those other financial instruments that are out there. Mr. Pat Sheehan. Uh, I've got a last con. Uh, the Minister just answered my question in his last answer. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number four, please. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The campaign has two main strands. The first strand involves a collation, analysis, and presentation of data on the energy use and performance of buildings occupied by the Northern Ireland departments and other public sector bodies. Officials in my department are presently drafting the 2011 to 2012 report. The second strand was the Central Energy Efficiency Fund used to support energy efficiency projects within buildings occupied by public sector bodies in Northern Ireland. Over its lifetime, the fund supported 2,598 different projects. My department has also hosted a series of seminars to raise the profile of energy efficiency for premises officers, departmental energy managers and energy representatives from the wider public sector, and this will be continuing into the future. Call Ms. Judith Cochran for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister um, for his answer. I've read about a number of, um, sort of best practice um, case studies um, around this campaign, and I'm just wondering, um, does the Minister have proposals to ensure that the scheme is rolled out further um, so that the benefits of reduced energy costs can um, be um, appreciated by other public sector bodies? Yep. Well, I think the scheme was, a, a Deputy Speaker, whenever it was, was operating, was a, a, a success, and, and the member is right to identify that there were some best practice examples which we're uh, rightly proud of. Um, however, the fund was closed at the end of March of 2011, and there were two sort of broad reasons why it did close down. The first was that the, the generally short payback periods involved in investing in this technology, uh, energy efficiency technology, um, provided sufficient incentive for public bodies to invest in them either via their own funds, so out of their own departmental budgets and using the benefits that would accrue over time, or via invest to save opportunities, which my department obviously releases from time to time. Uh, the second broad reason was that there were other drivers to uh, promote and incentivize energy efficiency, including carbon re reduction commitment energy efficiency scheme, which was formerly known as just the carbon reduction commitment. Uh, at present, I have no plans to, to reintroduce a scheme like the um, uh, uh, Central Energy Efficiency Fund. And one of the reasons as well is because new regulations in respect of public sector buildings, the eligible buildings regulations of 2013 came into force in January of this year. And Article 5 of those regulations, which comes into practice in June of this year, uh, specifically addresses public bodies and public sector buildings and requires each public sector body to have an energy efficiency plan in place. So instead, Deputy Speaker, of having a fund where departments or public sector bodies could dip in and dip out of as they, they came up with ideas, we're actually mainstreaming this as a duty on departments to have energy efficiency plans and to invest their own resources in technologies with, which will release energy efficiency benefits. Well, Mrs. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I also thank the Minister for his answer? Um, there was a finding that the baseline was not sufficiently robust to measure targets. Has this now been corrected? And what are the main results for the last five years? We're, we're still um, finalising the most recent results, as I mentioned in the, the answer to the original question. Uh, I'll be very keen, whenever that, that's for. 2011 to 2012, very keen to reflect on, on what improvements have been made in, in that period of time. Um, look, I, I, I take a view that well, I, I think this is an incredibly important area of work. It's maybe not the most uh, sort of upfront piece of work that this department works, but uh, looking after our public uh, sector estate, which is quite, quite sizable, um, and, and in terms of its age, quite old, and therefore trying to reduce the, the, not just the carbon footprint, but the 
uh, increasing its energy efficiency is incredibly important. And it's an area which we have identified as a department within our own departmental plans as an area where savings can be made, uh, monetary savings can be made. So I'm very keen to make sure that it is uh, an area which is pursued. I'm not convinced that the uh, energy campaign that we had before, which, as I said, in response to Mrs Cochrane, had a, a fund which departments could bid for, was absolutely the right way to do it, and perhaps that's why some of those problems did develop over time. Uh, and I think that mainstreaming it as we are doing it through a regulatory duty is probably a better way to get the results that we want. Well, Mr Farragut McKinney. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. And can I ask the Minister, has he conducted any assessment, along with colleagues, about the value of LED public street lighting, uh, and particularly its financing, given the uh, potential uh, vast savings involved? Principally, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, it would be a responsibility for my ministerial colleague, the Minister for Regional Development. Uh, and I, you know, without trying to answer for him, I know it's uh, sort of an occupational hazard for the, the Minister of, of Finance and Personnel. He gets asked, uh, answered, qu asked questions about everybody's responsibility. Uh, you know, I do think that it's uh, an area where the Minister has been rolling, his Department of Road Service has been rolling out uh, LED um, lights and street lighting uh, right across Northern Ireland. I've seen some of them myself in my own constituency and elsewhere. Uh, and I'm convinced that it, 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 it would save money. And obviously, it would have to be done on a case-by-case -case basis, and the business case would need to be robust. But I'd certainly not be, be found wanting in terms of trying to fund that sort of work. In fact, a lot of the, the money that we have given to DRD through monitoring rounds this year and previous years has been specifically for street lighting, and I imagine that whenever that actually hits the ground and is rolled out, that it is in exactly the sort of format that the member is talking about. Mr. Jimmy Spratt for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question five. Speaker, while the, the detail of the proposed new Belfast Transport Hub is a subject for the Regional Development Minister, it is something which I have discussed with a view to exploring potential funding options. My officials have been engaged with DRD regarding the potential use of uh, financial transactions capital to fund this project. It is also one of the projects I was referring to last week and indeed earlier when I said that I, I want to personally follow up the possibility of further European investment bank investment in Northern Ireland when I have talks with bank officials in Luxembourg later this month. Well, Mr Spratt for a supplementary. Thank you Deputy Speaker uh, and can I thank the Minister for his answer. This is a scheme that has huge uh, economic benefits for the whole of Northern Ireland, not just the city of Belfast. Does the Minister uh, see the proposed new transport hub in Belfast uh, as an opportunity uh, to actually partner uh, with the uh, private sector? I, I do I see it as a, the perfect opportunity to do that. And, and I know the, the member, Mr. Spratt, has been very supportive of the scheme since its inception, both in his capacity as, as, as chair of the, the DRD committee and, of course, I think the, the proposed Belfast Transport Hub would be in his South Belfast constituency as well. I, I think it is a perfect opportunity. I think it's a fantastic project. I want to support the project and, and uh, support the DRD minister in taking the scheme forward, and that's why I've been personally engaged with him on it and having um, authorised officials to do likewise with, with his officials. It, it would represent, I think, an excellent modern infrastructure, a new gateway into Belfast and in, into Northern Ireland, and obviously have a, an integrated public transport hub for our capital city. Um, but because, where I think it has the, the opportunity to, to be a, a, a proper beneficial public-private partnership is because of the obvious use of uh, development of office space, potential for development of office space. I think the uh, DRD has earmarked around about uh, 10 acres for about a million square foot of mixed-use development on the site. Uh, and I think that whilst you know, we will do the transport bit pretty well within government, I think mixed-use developments and office space is not something that we do in government. So I think that we, if we are to, to avail of the huge opportunities that there are on the site in Great Victoria Street, uh, I think it is an ideal opportunity for us to partner with the private sector, and that's why I have spoken to the uh, Regional Development Minister about potentially using financial transactions or capital, which requires us in government to directly partner with the private sector. And because that opportunity is, I believe, there, it might mean that a scheme which might have been taking several years to come to fruition might actually be advanced much quicker. Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And, uh interested in the Minister's responses. The hub obviously has the potential to create um, quite a lot of uh, economic growth and indeed probably increased property values. Can the Minister advise if in fact there is a strategic plan in place, and with, including stakeholders, to ensure we make the maximum of this development? Yeah, again, very, the, the Minister for Regional Development, his department, are very much in the lead in taking this, this scheme forward. My, my involvement is to 
as you might expect, to try to find Deputy Speaker, the, the money to make it happen. And, you know, I think moving forward, uh, investment in our infrastructure is something, and you, you'll hear me talking about this all the time, investment in our infrastructure is absolutely key to growing our economy again, um, uh, particularly where it involves reviving the private sector side of, of the equation. As a member will know from, from his membership of the committee, the public sector has kept up its side of the balance, in fact an increasing side of the balance over the last number of years. We need to reinvigorate our, our private sector, and I think this is an opportunity to do that. Um, but you're, he's absolutely right. We need to, given the strategic nature of the site, the huge opportunity there is to create uh, new jobs and perhaps answer some other uh, issues and pro answer some other questions that we have, including the development of Grade A office accommodation in and around the city centre. I think you know, to, to just see this as solely a transport issue would be wrong. I think we need to widen it out, see it as strategically important for the whole of Northern Ireland, uh, and develop it uh, accordingly. Order. That ends the period for oral questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Mr. Declan McAleer. Uh, um, in light of the reduced budget in the Rural Development Programme, uh, will the, um, the, the, the Minister support the Dard Minister in her bid to the Executive for additional funding to support the Going for Growth strategy? Look, Mr. Deputy Speaker, responsibility for the Rural Development Programme remains the Minister of Agriculture's responsibility, and if she believes that there is a shortfall in the programme, uh, it is her responsibility to come forward with bids um, at the appropriate time whenever we get to, to the budget next year. Mr Megley here for a supplementary. Uh, I'm reflecting on the irony of the Minister's response given the fact that uh, there was a court challenge that was initiated by myself which resulted in this uh, decision in many ways. Uh, has the Minister had any discussion with the Dartmouth or any of the executive colleagues about the possibility of executive fund to bridge this gap? Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, I would rather have not spent um, part of the Christmas break uh, with uh, lawyers in the Kai Court in Belfast finding a case which uh, I want to put on record and remind people that, of course, I won. Um, the minister, I would rather we didn't have to do that, or rather the minister had taken a, a much more mature and sensible approach to this issue, and perhaps a, a resolution could have been found, but she left, it, left me with no option but to go to the court and to, of course, you know, win that case, which showed that she had breached the ministerial code. So I don't think there's any irony in that regard. Um, I have been on record repeatedly, both before the case and after, in saying that some of the schemes that are um, funded by the Rural Development Programme, particularly those that uh, diversify our rural economy, are schemes that I am supportive of um, in respect of the likes of going for growth. I have been on record in saying that I won't be found wanting whenever bids come forward for funding to exploit the huge potential that there is within the agri-food sector within Northern Ireland. But of course, these are all issues for primarily the Minister for Agriculture to come forward with appropriate bids at the appropriate time for executive funds, which are, of course, as everyone in this House will know, Deputy Speaker, scarce. Call Lord Morrow. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for his assessment? Could he tell the House today for uh, give us his assessment of the current state of the Northern Ireland economy? Um, I think our economy is, is, is improving. I think there are almost daily signs now, Deputy Speaker, that our economy is moving in the right direction, that we are um, well on the road to economic recovery after five or six very difficult years in, in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, I very much welcome the publication today of the uh, latest Ulster Bank uh, Purchasing Managers Index, which has uh, shown a further sharp rise in business activity within the private sector. I think it's encouraging to see new business starting to, to develop, uh, employment go up, exports go up, and some, some firms even reporting uh, backlogs of work within their businesses. So I think that all in all, and when you couple that with our official statistics in respect of unemployment, uh, economic growth last year of 1.2% of between quarter three of last year and quarter three of the year before, um, housing market activity starting to uh, accelerate, and new, I think I saw last week, Deputy Speaker, new car registrations in Northern Ireland uh, rise by 20% last year. I think all in all, our economy is moving slowly but surely in the right direction, albeit with the odd bump on the road to recovery. Paul Morrow for supplementary. Well, I thank the Minister for his uh, reply, which I've listened to very diligently, and it's quite comprehensive. But 
Uh, Deputy Speaker, can I ask the, the Minister in my supplementary state that there is great concern at the lack of clarity about the scale of the Ulster Bank's future operation, which in turn is causing concern among staff and clients? And does he agree with the latest remarks from the Institute of Chartered Accountants that banks pose a threat to recovery? Deputy Speaker, I, you know, I think everyone in this House would agree. Uh, no matter what our, our experiences that we have seen in our constituencies and through businesses operating on our own localities, that moving forward we absolutely need our banks to do their job, uh, even if some of them have not been doing their job over the last number of years. Um, and, and I absolutely understand the points that, that constituents are making to Lord Morrow. They are making the same points to me and I know to many members in this House, employees of, uh, of Ulster Bank, who are not entirely sure about what the future holds for them personally. Uh, I met along with the Deputy uh, First Minister and Deputy First Minister a few weeks ago, Ross McEwen, who is the Chief Executive of RBS Group. I am in regular contact with Jim Brown, the Chief Executive of Ulster Bank, and Elvina Graham, the Head of the Ulster Bank in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, and as you would expect, we have sought, sought assurances in respect of what the bank would look like moving forward in Northern Ireland. I think we need to emphasise how important Ulster Bank is to the economy in Northern Ireland. It is by far our biggest bank. It has huge market share in terms of uh, business customers in Northern Ireland. But it is very clear from those conversations, very clear from the review that was published a couple of weeks ago, that Ulster Bank, moving forward, Ulster Bank in Northern Ireland and indeed in Ireland as a whole will be a much smaller bank. And whenever I listen to them talk about how online transactions and telephone banking is increasing exponentially. It's very easy to see why, albeit incredibly hard when the impact hits on the ground, why the branch structure will not be as big moving forward as it is currently. Although, notwithstanding that uncertainty that does still remain about uh, bank uh, branches and what branches will close and how many people will be retained in employment in the bank, I am somewhat assure, assured that the Ulster Bank brand is here and it is here to stay that credit decisions will still be taken in Belfast, that a board of the Ulster Bank will still remain in place, and that I suppose in order to improve service, there will be better integration between Ulster Bank and RBS, both in terms of IT and various products that are there. So I, I do share the concerns that the member has, but there is some positive news within the review that Ulster Bank isn't going to be subsumed into RBS and therefore done away with as a local bank. Mr. Oliver McMullen for a topical question. Last August, Minister, you announced the establishment of the Public Sector Reform Division. Could you, Minister, now give the Assembly an update on the work in progress? Well, I'm tempted to refer the member to the, 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 the answer that I gave a few minutes ago. Um, the Reform Division has been established now since the early autumn. Um, it has in, in been busy at work in terms of getting a, a programme of work developed. It is looking at a whole range of issues that are um, troubling not just our public sector, but public sectors across Europe and further afield. Uh, it is working um, with other departments, as I mentioned, in response to, to Mr. Ross's question. Uh, I am personally engaging with other ministers to uh, show what uh, the Public Sector Reform Division, which is um, a small core staff, uh, has drawn in staff from, from the old PEDU and also from business uh, consultancy services is working in partnership with already with some departments, including the Department of Agri Agriculture on a particular project, uh, and will also be extending that work and working with other departments to um, try to bring not just efficiencies in terms of how we deliver our services, but also um, clear improvements and better outcomes in our service delivery here in Northern Ireland. Mr. McMullen for a supplementary. Thank the Minister for, for, for his, his answer. Will the Minister um, outline to me Will the uh, division uh, be including consideration of privatisation or outsourcing of work currently carried out by the public sector? That, that isn't an issue that the, the division is, is currently looking at, although I have to say that you know, I'm not adverse to working with people from outside of the public sector. I don't think, as I said earlier, I don't think any of us have a monopoly on wisdom, and I think the same goes for, for governments. I think governments should be actively working with not just the private sector, but also the third sector, and I see some of the work that we take forward, which could be in, for example, sort of task and finish group type format or using innovation labs, which is something that we're very, very keen to look at, and in fact act actively looking at, um, where we bring in external expertise. Um, and I think that in answering some of those big social and economic problems that we face in Northern Ireland, to think that 
we have the answers just solely within the public sector is wrong and we need to draw in experience. Uh, you know, and I have no particular ideological hang-up about who delivers public services, which is, I think, something that is, is mirrored in terms of the views of the public in Northern Ireland. But, uh, and in fact, many, many of, our, of our services are delivered, particularly by social enterprises and third sector organisations and charities. I think there is huge potential, particularly within that sector, for um, work, to, work that we are doing, but not always succeeding in achieving the right outcomes, could be done more by the third sector. I'm very, very keen to look at alternative models of service delivery, such as using social enterprises, charities, community and voluntary organisations. Uh, also very keen to look at how we could develop potentially a mutual sector within public services in Northern Ireland, again giving, giving workers who tend to know how these things work best a lot more power in delivering services. So there are a wide range of areas in which we will look at, but as I, as I said in response to, to Mr Mackay, this is not an issue of a wholesale privatisation of public services in Northern Ireland. Well, Mr Michael Copeland for a topical question. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And could I ask the Minister to advise, if possible, if all the financial transactions capital which has been allocated to Northern Ireland will be spent during the current year? Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, not all the money allocated this year will be spent this year. Uh, I was successful in negotiating along with other devolved administrations within the United Kingdom a flexibility um, to. I think we are allowed to move 20% of expenditure, up to 20% of expenditure this year rolled into next year, so that was roughly about £8 million worth of our FTC allocation we were allowed to roll into next year. The figure is 10% next year, that's of a total of about £60 million. The reason the Chief Secretary was keen to do that and allowed us to do that was because he realised that this was a new device and we were just still developing various projects and many of them were in their infancy, so uh, he realised that some flexibility was required. We, we have uh, successfully negotiated that and I think Roughly £5 million has gone unspent this year, but that is allowed to be rolled into next year, which means that no money has actually been lost to the Northern Ireland budget. Mr. Copeland, for a supplement. Um, thank you very much again, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. Could the Minister um, give an indication if he expects the funding through the financial transactions and capital to grow over the next two or three years? Yeah, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I do. And I think there, there's very good evidence that that's going to be the case. Um, it was brought in uh, for this was the first year of it, the year that we're currently in. As I said, it, we have a £40 million budget this year. Next year's is £60 million. It then rises quite rapidly to 127 for the following year, which, as a member in the House will appreciate, is a, a large amount of money and a large percentage, over 10 per cent of our overall total capital budget, which poses a challenge for me. It poses a challenge for executive colleagues to come up with those sorts of projects, and some of those projects that we were talking about earlier that will fit neatly into that public-private partnership type approach. Um, 127 million may not be the upper, uh, the final level of uh, FTC for 15-16. Um, for uh, I would expect, um, although I'm not certain about this, that next week's budget announcement may see further switch from current expenditure to capital and that the uh, FTC will be the, the vehicle which will be used to increase uh, capital expenditure moving forward. So 60 million next year and 127 million next year may actually see that rise, which as I say does pose huge challenges for us as an executive. Mr Adrian McQuillan for a topical question. Thank you. Mr Deputy Speaker, could I ask the Minister to give us his views on how the local housing markets perform? Th thank the member for his question. I think this is another, just as I, I answered Lord Morrow in I think positive terms about the economy in general, I, I think we can be uh, confident um, about the housing market as well. And we see confidence returning uh, to our housing market. Um, house sales in quarter four of, of last year were at 4,800, which was a, a six-year high in respect of, of house sales. I know house sales in the members' con constituency were among the, the highest in number and the highest in, in, in level of price. That, that 4,800 sales was a 28 per cent increase in the same quarter from 2012. So I think that after many, many years where there has been little or no activity in private housing in Northern Ireland, we are at last seeing confidence returning. The housing market is more buoyant uh, and it is moving forward, no matter what the uh, Chancellor or the Governor of the Bank of England might say about it. Well, Mr McCullen for supplementary. Here again, Mr. Deputy Speaker, can I also ask the Minister then for thoughts on, thoughts on the recent reports about the negative equity in Northern Ireland? Yeah, I, I, I read um, 
some reports in the press, I think this time last week, about negative equity as a particular problem in Northern Ireland, and I do accept that it is a problem, and is, is a problem here just as it is a problem elsewhere. I think there is one health warning that I would put to the figures that were widely reported within the press. Um, the figure that was reported was that there was 41 per cent of mortgages in negative equity. If you look at the sort of fine print of the, the report, it is 41 per cent of mortgages um, since 2005 that are actually in, in negative equity. So it is uh, a considerably lower percentage of the total um, mortgages since 2005 would account for less than 10 percent of our, our total housing stock in Northern Ireland. So whilst it is bad, and I accept it is bad, it is, it is bad because negative equity is bad because it, it obviously stops some people from moving, but it also saps confidence of people who maybe do want to move um, for fear of getting caught in it. Um, so you know, clearly we want to see some positive progress. I'm not sure about some of the, the sort of wild ideas that were put out there that we as a government should be somehow uh, financially getting involved in this area of, and hopefully a, a rising property market, a more buoyant, more confident property market will resolve many of those negative equity problems here in Northern Ireland. Order, members, time is up.